Hey there, guys. This is John Evans. Welcome back to Book in Spain. Uh, today's podcast, we return with Dr. Lydia, Lydia McGrew in discussion of her new work on the Gospel of John, The Eye of the Beholder. So, Lydia, for those viewers who are not yet well acquainted with your excellent work, The Mirror of the Mask, uh, or uh, with uh, Plain of View, uh, if you could introduce yourself and your latest work on the Gospels. Thanks for having me, John. It's good to be here. So my name is Lydia McGrew. I am a widely published analytic philosopher. So my, the majority of my publications have been in the field of philosophy. My PhD is in English literature. And then in the last several years, beginning with a book in 2017, I've been writing in the field of New Testament studies while I continue to publish in philosophy as well. So this is actually the third field uh, that I've entered in a slightly unconventional fashion. I, I entered uh, English literature as an autodidact and then got a fellowship at um, Vanderbilt University. And then I entered philosophy as an autodidact and also working with my husband, Tim McGrew, and then published um, in peer reviewed journals for the last 20, 20 some years. And now I'm entering uh, New Testament studies also and publishing in, in that field. So um, we did an interview earlier on the mirror or the mask, and that was a lot of fun. And then this new book, uh, The Eye of the Beholder, is just on the Gospel of John, and I call it The Gospel of John as Historical Reportage. And we'll be talking about that today in more detail, but the idea is to defend the very strong historical reliability of the Gospel of John. Absolutely. Now, Lydia, one of the interesting details which you show in the introduction to Eye of the Beholder is your journey towards focusing an entire work dedicated to John. Uh, where did your interest specifically in the fourth gospel come and what was some of the genesis of that research? Right. So I view the Eye of the Beholder and the Mirror of the Mask as, in a sense, companion volumes. Nonetheless, you could read them separately. You don't have to read them together. You could read either of them by itself. Uh, so I realized as I was studying New Testament scholarship, including some evangelical New Testament scholarship on the Gospels, that the Gospel of John comes in for an extra measure of skepticism. Once I realized that and the, the nature of that skepticism, I realized it was going to take another book to cover, cover that. So I cover certain things in the mirror or the mask, like John reclaims about all four of the gospels, but then there are specific doubts that get raised just specifically about John's gospel, that it's even more historically questionable than the others. And so there was no way, I mean, if you have the mirror of the mask, you know, it's already fairly thick because I had to go into all of that Greco-Roman background to cover that thoroughly. So there was no way I was gonna also be able to cover these extra doubts about the gospel of John. And I was very struck by the, the extreme disconnect between the special way that pastors and laymen regard John, which is as especially beloved, especially good, especially insightful, and the way that scholars regard the Gospel of John, which is as especially doubtful, especially historically questionable. So there's this big, you know, gap. And so I thought, well, I want to I want to recover that so that uh, the laymen and the pastors who have this special love for John can um, believe justifiably that that is that that is true that that's accurate historically rather than being uh just something that they feel or do because of their personal feelings you know one of the aspects you mentioned in the mirror of the mask is a point that historically has always hit me like a dagger between the eyes and that is you know if you look comparatively at most ancient literature you know the gap between the writings of plato and our first manuscript evidence is something like a thousand five hundred years disconnected by a different continent I believe even by different language and in fragmentary form. The gap between the traditional dating of the authorship of John, let's say 80 circa 80, 90, 96 in Ephesus, uh, and our earliest papyri, I think it's in Alexandria, it's like a fragment of the codices, I think chapters 18 or 19, is only about, I think, 20 to 25 years after the fact. And you can even bump that up if you want to. So with that close proximity, it makes us take a step back. But one of the details that you've, I think, highlighted in this work is since in The Mirror and the Mask, you dealt with the question of genre, 
Uh, now the real question fundamentally comes down to uh, ways in which the scholarly field, even the so-called evangelical scholarly field, has been trying to uh, perhaps raise objections and how those objections uh, when viewed through the lens of you know, a, a sober philosophical historical method actually can be met with some, uh, some resounding results. So I was wondering if, if you could go through uh, first uh, some of the objections and some of the counter objections. I, I think your opening chapter, The Red-Headed Stepchild was particularly, uh, if I might say so, it's, it's an adorable comparison. Uh, it, it definitely illustrates, I think, colorfully how on first glance, John might appear supposedly to stick out like a sore thumb when in reality, there's much more harmonization in regards to historical uh, methodology and historical approach. Right, I think people, uh, scholars especially, will often look at John and they'll, they'll just see it as different. And that's where the redheaded stepchild metaphor comes in, which is this kid that looks different from his siblings. And then it's doubted whether he's really a member of the family. <clears throat> and uh, that's partly because John has so much unique material. He has material that's different from the other gospels. Uh, the way that scholars will then approach John is with what I as a, a epistemologist would call a high prior probability that it has non-historical passages and segments. And then the only question they have in their minds is, well, where are those? Uh, and then that justifies all of these complicated theories. So for example, if there's an apparent, they view it as an apparent discrepancy concerning when Jesus died, what day Jesus died on, or when Jesus cleansed the temple, they're like, aha, this must be where those are, because they, they were assuming, entering it, that there were, quote unquote, those, the, these ah, historical passages. Now it's just a matter of figuring out, you know, which ones they are. So I, I deny that high prior probability to begin with. And Therefore, I want to cast a, a light, shine a light on the fact that it, it's really jumping to conclusions from these very uh, minuscule indications that this is a place where something was changed. So I'll, I'll give one example here, um, and that is the supposed changing of the day of Jesus' crucifixion. So uh, an example would be in John 18, it says that the rulers, the, the religious rulers, did not want to enter Pilate's hall so that they would not be defiled, that they might, quote unquote, eat the Passover. Um, and that's assumed by many scholars to mean the Passover in the evening, uh, that they didn't want to be defiled so they could eat the Passover the, in the evening. Then they say, okay, so this means that the first Passover meal hasn't occurred yet. Okay, so that they take that to mean that that first evening Passover meal hasn't happened yet in John 18 when Jesus is before Pilate. So then the idea is, well, but in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, he ate the Passover meal already. So allegedly there's a contradiction. They immediately will go from, okay, we think there's a contradiction to John must have moved Jesus' death to a different day of the month. And I think there's a real failure to recognize just how implausible that theory is. Well, let's just look at that particular verse. So you're John, you want to make Jesus be more like the Passover lamb. So you want to make him die on the same day that the Passover lambs were slaughtered, which would be during the day on Nisan 14. And so instead of saying Jesus was killed on the day when the Passover lambs were slaughtered, uh, or even mentioning Passover lambs at all, which John does not do anywhere, anywhere in his gospel. In fact, uh, John the Baptist says, behold the Lamb of God, but he doesn't say behold the Passover lamb of God, which is interesting. And even that is many, many chapters earlier. Nowhere in the proximity, the vicinity of, of the crucifixion does he mention lambs. There's no mention of lambs. Um, so you don't do that. Instead, you do the super subtle thing. You literally invent a scruple on the part of the religious leaders and you, you pretend that they didn't want to enter Pilate's hall lest they be defiled so they could eat the Passover meal, um, which didn't happen. And you just insert that in the hopes that your readers will go, oh, so that must mean this was the day when the Passover lambs were killed and Jesus is the Passover lamb. Cool. I get it. And then you publish this gospel in Ephesus 
and you have a, a largely at the end of the first century. So your audience is composed either uh, partly of Gentiles who never knew what day the Passover lambs were killed and partly of Jews after the fall of Jerusalem when no Passover lambs are being killed now anyway. And you expect them to ferret this out like a little code. That's ridiculous. I mean, I realize people will say ridiculous is not a scholarly word, but there really is no other word for it. That is such a convoluted hypothesis. Um, and I think it's only because of that high prior probability of, of uh, some kind of change in facts that you would take that uh, minor apparent discrepancy to indicate that. And then I could tell you what the answer is to it as well, but I just wanted to, to point out how um, much of a return of conjecture they're getting for such a trifling investment of fact. Absolutely, and, and with the, the answer, do you hold to the hypothesis? Uh, it, it's been about two weeks since I read the book. So a lot of, a lot of different data is swimming in this brain along with a lot of N.T. Wright, William Lane Craig. But um, the thing about it is, do you hold to the hypothesis that there were multiple days for the Passover lamb to cram as many people in? What was the, the answer that's given? Because I, I know that there are ways of harmonizing the chronology quite beautifully. It's, right. it's not, yeah. Right, so well, um, one thing to know is that probably if they had entered Pilate's Hall and been ceremonially unclean, they could have cleansed themselves at sundown anyway. Now, there's some disagreement about that, depending on what kind of uncleanness it was. But it seems pretty clear when we read the Old Testament and so forth that it could only have been some kind of uncleanness that would last till evening. So this that they might eat the Passover, actually just taking John on his own and and putting it together with what we know of uh the uncleanness it seems like it needed to be a meal during the day anyway not the evening passover so again this isn't like desperately attempting to harmonize this is just saying what kind of uncleanness would it be and and when would that meal be so then when you you get oh it looks like it would have been a daytime passover again just on its face even before we try to harmonize with the synoptics. Then we go and we discover that there was that Feast of Unleavened Bread uh, that continued and that there was a meal known as the Hagiga uh, that would have been at, eaten at noon. And that could be, these later Hagiga meals could be referred to as the Passover. And that would have been the meal for which they would have been rendered unclean. In which case, John actually fits together beautifully with the synoptics there that it was that the Hagiga on Friday um, and on 15 Nisan that they wanted to be able to eat. You know, one detail I want to actually cover with you before we move on to uh, the, the sock puppet Jesus and the, uh, the Jesus as a mouthpiece for John, mm -hmm. which follows a lot of those uh, critical methods. What's unique, I find, just reading the Gospel of John, and, and you do mention it later on in, in, in your text quite beautifully, is the minute Jewish and geographical details that John layers in almost paragraph by paragraph. The existence, for example, of Canaan of Galilee only attested in archaeology and in Flavius Josephus. Uh, the reality, for example, that the well, uh, Jacob's well in Samaria happens to be deep. Uh, the reality, for example, that the term Jews mean Judeans, a, a local geographical term is employed. That would have made, you know, those distinctions would have made little sense, as you said, in AD 90, well after the destruction of the temple in AD 70. Uh, the fact that even the I am statements themselves that come as you and I both know, under increasing attack. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. Before Abraham was, I am. Only really makes sense to either a highly uh, literate Gentile audience that's immersed themselves in Torah, which is highly unlikely, um, or to a primarily Jewish audience. So out of curiosity, just from your own experience, with that much historical details, including political digs at Caiaphas, he was high priest that year mm -hmm. when the high priesthood was, you know, being under a rotation as we discussed by the Roman authorities. Um, how, how can a scholar look at that material and then sideswipe all of that away as merely um, a difference in genre? It, it seems as though a different standard is being applied to John that would never be even applied to the synoptics, although technically they're only about 30 years apart in terms of composition. Right, well, they unfortunately will do it with the synoptics as well. I think there's just a huge, but, but more with John, more with John for sure. I think there's a huge presupposition that's going on here that's very anachronistic. So um, 
and skeptics do it too. And it's just sad to see Christians kind of join the skeptics with this. We have a genre in our own time of highly realistic historical fiction. Uh, I'm actually fond of historical fiction. Uh, I, I like to read the novels of Edith Pargeter, also known as Ellis Peters. She's the creator of Brother Cadfell. If anybody watches those mysteries, I guess I'm dating myself here, but there, there we go. She wrote in the 90s, yeah. and, uh, but she has straight novels. She does as well, many of them focusing on whales, all very sad, uh, you know, like your favorite characters all die and so forth. But anyway, she's uh, very well-researched, enormously well researched and so you can go and check out the history of the time and you actually find that she's got a lot of stuff correct and so what the the modern critics will do is they will act as though not only did that genre exist at the time but we can just assume that the gospels are written in that genre despite presenting themselves as historical which is interesting i mean obviously you know edith pargeter never pretended to be uh presenting anything other than historical fiction you know she made it quite clear that these were novels and so forth but uh the the scholars will enter it that way and they'll just say so then it doesn't matter. And you get this in mainstream scholars, but unfortunately you get, you get it in some evangelical scholars as well. I've been recently reading some portions of a book by Jörg Frey, who is a very um, pretty, I, I think he wouldn't mind being called a liberal scholar, definitely a mainstream scholar, uh, a book on the fourth gospel published by Baylor University Press in 2018. And he literally lists a bunch of those kind of details you were just listing a moment ago. And he says, but all of this is irrelevant. He says it, it just doesn't matter because the, it could be added for effect. It could be added for credibility. So they're basically inventing the genre of highly realistic historical fiction that has as if John had put all of this in there just to kind of make it look good. And then they're transporting it 2000 years back to his time. And then they're just assuming that's what it is. And once you assume that's what it is, then of course you're gonna be very closed to all additional evidence. No matter how much comes in, you're just gonna keep saying, yeah, well, doesn't he do a great job with that historical fiction, you know, basically, or partially historical fiction or something of that kind. So I think that's kind of how they shut themselves off to, to that evidence. You know, one of the interesting segue thoughts in, in relationship to the question of genre and dialogue is also to the implausibility of, first of all, how early the dating of the text is in comparison to the historical event. Um, and of course, even, and we can discuss uh, later on in regards to questions of authorship, even if we're not to take, as, as you and I both do, um, apostolic authorship, uh, you're dealing with uh, a text within the realm of eyewitness history and eyewitness memory. So I, I can't think of another comparative example in, in ancient literature, I'm sure there is plenty, of a eyewitness producing a work uh, with in living memory of the other witnesses not being contested, and that work basically being passed off as fiction. So for example, had Jesus never said something like, uh, I am the light of the world, before Abraham was I am, I am the way, the truth, and the life, uh, it seems implausible, one, that the book of Acts would ever refer to the early church as the way, uh, that we would see linguistic echoes throughout the gospels, much of your first work in plain view. And then two, it seems as though we would see a, a massive uh, disconnect, right, between the way uh, the disciples of John, uh, Irenaeus, Ignatius, Irenaeus, of course, disconnected by Polycarp, but we can assume that there is uh, enough closeness. Um, we would assume that the audience of the text would have said is somewhere in writing, oh, this is fiction, but Matthew, Mark, and Luke are more historical. And we, and we know that distinction. We want to preserve this for posterity, considering posterity was of severe interest to the uh, early patristic era, uh, down to a genealogy trying to work things out precisely. These are not people treating this as a historical. They had walked on the very rocks where this thing had happened. And some of them had met and seen Peter and Paul crucified, well, Paul beheaded. So my ultimate question in my own heart and mind is with that closeness and proximity, um, from a philosophical angle, isn't it merely just a matter of probability? It is strictly improbable that you could have a text that is uh, concocting material. It, it seems like the argument of silence cuts both ways that it's the very silence of any criticism against the Gospels 
that somewhat defends uh, the fourth gospel's attestation to the words and sayings of Jesus. Well, I think it's not even only silence. Uh, we find the, the gospel of John quoted in uh, Justin Martyr. So uh, he says something about that it's, he's talking about baptism and that they bring the catechumens to be baptized. And he says something about being born again. And then he says, for it is evident that it is not possible for a man to enter again into his mother's womb and be born. So he's, he's obviously quoting the, uh, or quoting from memory, you know, approximately quoting the dialogue between Jesus and Nicodemus. Um, so they treat it as positively authoritative, definitely. And I think the way that scholars have to get around that is to, in a sense, project a kind of soft postmodernism onto the pre-moderns. Now, this is this is common. This happens all the time and in the humanities, not only in biblical studies, by the way. I've seen it in English literature. I've seen it in uh, history, uh, in classics. So in a variety of humanities disciplines, and it goes back to you know the 70s the 80s that you know it became cool in a sense to try to well for one thing diss the enlightenment and then secondly to say that a focus on objective fact objective truth and the ability to tell the difference between objective historical fact and uh fiction is is somehow enlightenment rationalism and that's bad and that the older authors uh and older people the pre-moderns uh didn't have that hang up that's just our hang up and then to try to make it cool when you find an author instead of just saying oh he made an error that's it he's not it's not historical oh no that was too harsh you had to say instead well he was a pre-modern so he didn't really care about that and what's what's really amusing about that is that it's actually very anachronistic. It, in the, under the guise of teaching us the way ancient people thought, what it's actually doing is projecting the uh, interests of late 20th and early 21st century humanities professors back onto the mindset of ancient people. So we'll be told, well, they, they didn't care. I mean, we got this in the 1980s in Robert Gundry's commentary on Matthew. Um, it was interesting because at first for like much of the body of his very large and very dreadful, absolutely awful commentary on Matthew. It's one of the, it's perhaps the greatest disaster in evangelical scholarship of the 20th century. Uh, he would say, oh, well, the early audience could have told that this was not uh, historical because they would have compared it with Mark. And if it wasn't in Mark, they would have taken it to be invented by Matthew. Now, this is enormously implausible. And suddenly he starts showing his hand in the theological conclusion. He's got that you get to the conclusion where he's going to talk about the implications of this. And suddenly he says, well, maybe, maybe they couldn't always tell, which was which it's like you think. And then he says, but they really didn't care. They really didn't care if they could tell what was or wasn't historical. And so you have, because they were pre-moderns, you know, and they didn't have our modern hang up about telling what was or wasn't historical. So you had other evangelical scholars out there, you know, staunchly defending Robert Gundry. Like he's not saying this was deceptive because he's saying they could have told. And it's like, well, first of all, that's so improbable that it's obviously just a fig leaf to, to cover this theory. But then second of all, he more or less admits that at the end and, and says, but because they didn't really care that much about it. When you go to Papias, you find Papias saying, yeah, your man, the vain man, your man, Papias. You find him saying, I was not interested in getting to the words of others to the words of other people. I wanted to know the words that proceeded from the truth itself, by which he meant Jesus, of course, which is kind of a Yoannine sound too. I am the truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And Papias wanted to get as close as possible as he could to uh, knowing what Jesus had actually taught and said. That's that's about as far as possible from this picture of an ancient man who didn't care about the distinction between fact and fiction. And one of the interesting things about that is that Papias doesn't say, unless they're apostles. If they're apostles, they could totally make up stuff because they're guided by the Holy Spirit. And so that's okay. You got no exception clause for the apostles. He doesn't want the words of mere men. He wants to know what Jesus did and said. So I think we need to recognize that those ancient men were, if anything, more concerned about literal fact than uh, we are in the 21st century. You know, and it is 
Papias's, you know, closeness to a lot of those details and his, his proximity presumably with the Apostle John. And with, by the term elders, uh, we could even presume the members of the 72 who are still alive. That should raise people's eye eyebrows. They, they, they should sincerely wonder whether we should trust Papias's account of, you know, an early patristic understanding of scripture rather than a university professor, no matter how eminent, no matter how well acclaimed, only 20, 30 years ago or even contemporaneous with ourselves. It seems to me I would rather trust the earlier eyewitness than you know someone, no matter how it claims you know in, in, in recent history. In the same way, I would trust, generally speaking, you know, an eyewitness on the ground for you know something in uh, the Second World War, uh, you know, collaborated with more contemporary facts, of course, rather than essentially discount all eyewitness history as, as, as mere uh, embellishment or exaggeration. The other factor too is Papias went under the risk of martyrdom. I mean, John was exiled to Patmos. All the other disciples of Christ seem to have faced hor horrid and gruesome deaths. So the desire to be dishonest to make a point doesn't fit the psychological profile in any way, shape, or form. So this, I think, is a great segue towards your point about the sayings of Jesus in the fourth gospel. And you know, this, for the viewers of the show here, this was my major introduction into Dr. Lydia McGrew because I was uh, attending a family wedding in Ireland and I was en route and I was rereading the Gospel of Mark. And I was disturbed in my spirit as I was reading because I noticed, you know, and I've you read the Gospels copiously for years upon years upon years upon years, but I noticed the difference in terms of syntax, in terms of flavor. And the difference was kind of uh, echoing in my brain. So I, I typed in the I am statements, you know, why the absence of the I am statements in the synoptic gospels. And right away, I find Dr. Craig Evans and Dr. Michael Lacona defending Dr. Craig Evans, uh, denying these critical historical points. And I couldn't for the life of me justify their point of view in light of, you know, my own rich Roman Catholic tradition, the, the existence of, of miracles documented in contemporary times, but also to historically the patristics. I knew Papias, I knew Arrhenaeus. Uh, but at the same time, uh, the question of the difference in voice or the apparent difference in voice rather troubled me until I discovered your work, your blog uh, and in your books and trying to get them in an accessible format. Now, one of the objections I saw raised repeatedly, not just by them, but by many other scholars and we're speaking strictly from a scholarly point of view. You know, I, I respect the scholarly community, but to deal with the arguments objectively, uh, they seem to be suggesting that John is putting words in Jesus's mouth. Never mind the fact that John happens to be the one disciple at the foot of the cross, the caretaker for Jesus's mother, uh, the eyewitness and companion of those who were martyred for the faith. Uh, and never mind the fact that he emphasizes the truth as we've discussed in an objective way. Um, how can we refute the sock puppet model that he is simply using Jesus as a model for his own thoughts and his own criteria? And why potentially might the synoptics have not gone there? Perhaps they've already made the point. Uh, the son of man, for example, is Lord of the Sabbath. Right. So we have to deal with a couple different things. One is that argument from silence that uh, the claims, the very explicit claims to be God, such as before Abraham was I am, are not contained in the synoptic gospels. Uh, and Bart Ehrman is a master of this. Uh, he's a skeptical New Testament scholar. He really hammers on this. Surely they would have included them, you know, surely, 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 you know, and um, you know the meme, don't call me Shirley. Anyway, yeah. so, um, <laughs> anyway, um, I think that's the first thing we want to tackle, which is that we wrongly assume that they, that the synoptic authors are sitting down and saying to themselves, what's the strongest possible thing that I can put down that Jesus said that would indicate that he was God? You know, as if all the synoptic authors are trying to answer an objection that Jesus wasn't God or that Jesus never claimed to be God. And then they're trying to be sure to include the strongest thing they, that they know of that he said that would counter that. We don't 
have any knowledge to the effect that that was their motive or that was their concern from which we could then reason that if they don't include before Abraham was I am, they must have uh, not ever heard of it or something like that. Um, they were, you know, it's very clear, Mark, you know, the, the gospel of Jesus, the Messiah, you know, um, Mark and Matthew are very interested in arguing that Jesus is the Messiah. Uh, Matthew has this very Jewish audience in mind, and that's like one of the first things they want to do is to present Jesus as, as it was called the Christ, the anointed one, the Messiah. And then you have Luke. Uh, Luke is writing first to Theophilus, a Gentile, and uh, I want to be careful about how I say this, but I think Luke has in some ways less of a theological interest than John does. I dedicated the Eye of the Beholder to two different people, one a, a recent, uh, recently deceased theological blogger named Steve Hayes, and the other an older author uh, named uh, Green Armitage. And Green Armitage has a book called John Who Saw, which is just a wonderful little book. Um, but he also wrote a book about Luke, which isn't quite as great, but I went ahead and bought it, you know, um, used book online. And one of the things Green Armitage says that I can sort of see is that Luke is more of a guy of action than a, uh, a, a guy of theology. And of course, he's, you're going to have theology. It's a gospel, you know, and he's telling you what Jesus taught and everything, that's for sure. But um, he's not primarily trying to teach theological truths. And also with a Gentile audience, there would be, I'd say this definitely, but a possibility of being misunderstood. If you say that Jesus is God, um, if they don't come at it from a very strongly monotheistic perspective to say that he's a God or God, they could understand as a God, which could potentially cause confusion with uh, polytheism. Now, that's just a very loose conjecture uh, as to why Luke might not have included that if he did indeed know of it. And that's all we have, our conjectures. We should be very cautious about using the argument from silence against a witness. It's one thing to use it when you don't have anybody. If I don't have anybody who tells me about a bomb that went off in Kalamazoo, Michigan today, I think I can pretty much conclude that no bomb went off in Kalamazoo, Michigan. But if I have one person that comes and says, oh my goodness, I, I saw the police all gathered around this intersection and one of the bystanders told me there was a bomb. And then I, tr I go in and I try to look it up in the news and I don't find anything about it in the news. I should be very careful about using the silence of the news to discredit the positive statement of the witness. And that's not a good argument. So that's the first thing about those I am statements and we need to be careful about that. And then the second thing has to do with this notion of Yohanin idiom and the way Jesus talks, which is used to argue that he embellishes Jesus' words with his own ways of speaking. So I don't wanna go on too long here, but uh, one thing we can do is distinguish paraphrase in, in a legitimate sense from embellishment. They're not the same thing. And then the second thing I think we can do is to distinguish several different senses of what might be meant by Yohanin idiom. So do we mean just themes? If we just mean themes by idiom, and then of course you're gonna have to use certain words to express those themes. So if truth is one of your themes, then you're gonna select places where Jesus uses the word aletheia, truth. And so then you're going to have that word occurring at a higher word frequency in your gospel, but that's just selection of material. Another thing we can mean by idiom are these incredibly trivial things like what connectives Jesus uses. Does he use chi or does he use de? Uh, or does he just leave out a connective or that kind of thing? These are so trivial that a legitimate sense of paraphrase allows for that. Um, and then a third sense of idiom is the connected nature of Jesus way of talking in John. He talks in a more connected way. Um, does that indicate elaboration? And I don't think that indicates elaboration either because it's actually more likely that the synoptic gospels would cut out repetition and connective material in order, and again, that's also legitimate paraphrase, in order to make it easier for people to just remember these sayings and um, these like proverbial sayings or short segments of what Jesus said, then that John would add that material by inventing it. Uh, he may just have had a good memory. It doesn't have to be a phenomenal memory, but there are definitely legitimate 
mechanisms whereby he could have remembered those more connected ways of speaking that Jesus had. So I think disambiguating paraphrase and disambiguating idiom uh, are two different ways to help us to understand that, in fact, we don't need to take that uh, somewhat of a different way of Jesus talking in John and the Synoptics to indicate that John elaborated and embellished. Also to the, the idea of the repeated word chi, and, 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 rather than a conjunction like but, which, you know, I, I believe it was you on another uh, podcast, I might have been with Jonathan McLaughlin, saying that that fits better in with Aramaic, actually. If someone is thinking in Aramaic terms, that, that works much better than having uh, differences in, uh, you know, transition. And also to the, the idea that I think you introduced quite beautifully uh, in your earlier interviews as well, if you look at any great preacher, Spurgeon, for example, the repetition is almost omnipresent. Are we really to assume, for example, that Jesus only has uh, three or four quick one-liners as in the synoptics and doesn't move on? I, I don't think that he only spoke in a, a more clipped synoptic way. And I don't think he only spoke in a high exalted way like we see in so-called Joponine idiom. And like you said, uh, would turn to the person at the dining room table and say, and may the son of man request you to please pass the salt. <laughs> Right. I, I think that that repetition is very realistic. And then and you find shorter phrases. We find uh, shorter sayings in John as well, but they tend to be embedded in these longer, uh, longer ways of talking. In fact, it's interesting. Richard Balcom has a really fascinating article. I think it's called Historiographical Characteristics of the Fourth Gospel, if I remember the title correctly. And in it, he actually says that the more connected discourses in John appear more realistic and would have appeared more realistic to the original audience. Uh, it, because he says, you know, nobody talks all the time in this short, choppy, choppy way. But then he says, you know, he kind of takes away with the left hand what he gives with the right. He says, so both John and the synoptics are having ways of representing Jesus' way of speaking, and John's appears more realistic, but it involves more than does the synoptic way putting words into Jesus' mouth. And it's just at that point that I get off the train and I say, wait, wait, Dr. Balcom, why? Why does it need to involve more than the synoptics putting words in Jesus' mouth? He doesn't give a premise. And I think, I think the premise has to be the premise of a limit on memory. We find this explicitly uh, stated or a little more clearly implied in other scholars. I've been doing a little research on that lately where um, there's this, this interesting evangelical scholar. I just came upon his work recently. His name is Peter W. Ensor, uh, E-N-S-O-R. He was a um, he was a missionary to Africa for a while. He's still uh, active, I believe, as a um, professor. I haven't been in contact with him, but I've been interested in reading a book it may have originally been his dissertation on Jesus sayings in John. And he really, really wants to argue for a more positive, optimistic position concerning Jesus um, or the accuracy of John's portrayal. But he keeps, in a sense, I think, like limiting himself more than he needs to. And it's an interesting thing to watch. And one of the things that Ensor says is, well, I, and this is a paraphrase, I don't remember how he puts it, but something to the effect that we really shouldn't think that John could have remembered things that were this long. And I look at that and I say, well, maybe not verbatim, but it's possible to give a very fair representation of even something that someone said on that occasion. Okay, not putting stuff together from various occasions and kind of moving it around, but on that occasion, that's not verbatim, but that someone could definitely recognize. So an illustration I would use is suppose you have a student with a really quite a good auditory memory and he's uh, telling his fellow students about his, a little discourse that his, uh, that his professor gave on the subject of looking in the syllabus before you ask questions. So he says, and they weren't there on that day. And you know, he puts on the gruff, you know, now, I am so tired of people who email me and they ask me a question, look in the syllabus. And then he, you know, goes on and the student, you know, gives more things that he said and stops and says, look in the syllabus. So he represents the teacher as saying, look in the syllabus or look in the syllabus first uh, six times. 
And then let's say that if you'd been there and you had an actual tape recording, the professor only said, look in the syllabus four times. Well, now the student isn't saying, well, I'm going to multiply the number of times that he said it. He's just trying to remember approximately where he said it and approximately how often he said, look at the syllabus. And he knows that he said it multiple times at approximately these places in his discourse on the top, on his syllabus discourse. And, uh, and he's doing a really good job. And if you had been there, you could have recognized the syllabus discourse as uttered on the first day of the semester. So I think that could very easily be what we have in the case of the of the fourth gospel and of John. And I think too, you know, we, we underestimate the possibility of pre-existent material. So every student of every major rabbi, I'm assuming, took some level of notes. And you know, in the Gospel of Mark, there are hired servants in the boat of the sons of Zebedee. So obviously James and John were not necessarily uh, of the lowest bracket of society. It's more than plausible that they had, you know, a, a more than competent form of literacy to keep up with the business in the same way that Matthew would need a different form of literacy to keep up with the business. And it's equally plausible to me that, you know, John in the upper room, along with potentially Matthew, could have been sitting down keeping some level of notes. If that's the case, you have a floating series of, you know, oral memory plus written memory. And so certain portions of the discourses may have been beloved and cherished. I mean, uh, you know, I, I, I am proud of my one little footnote in Eye of the Beholder, uh, where there's a reference uh, to being born again in First Peter. Mm -hmm. And the idea that, okay, that discourse with Nicodemus clearly was preserved in some form, be it written or be it oral. Um, I see no uh, problem with it being preserved in a, in a written form before, you know, 1890. Uh, that doesn't mean there needs to be a proto-gospel. That doesn't need, uh, need to mean that we must, you know, bump up the dating of John necessarily. But what, what it shows me is certain discourses could have been so beloved and cherished that they were ubiquitously known. And so ubiquitously known that someone, for example, like Paul might have made an offhanded reference now and again, implicitly or explicitly potentially at points, and why a Pauline voice seems to feel more and more like uh, a union between the synoptic portrait and the Johannine portrait implicit the entire time. I mean, it's hard to concoct that kind of harmonization with material you know, only 20, 30 years off from the events of the, uh, you know, the earthly ministry of Christ without suddenly performing somersaults to avoid the historicity of you know, John chapter three or potentially even uh, something as you know, pivotal as John 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Why should uh, Luke repeatedly refer to the church as the way? Why should John, before the court of the high priest say, we cannot help but confessing what we have seen and what we have heard, echoing you know, 1 John? It seems like the opponents would have to protest too much to quote Shakespeare to get get around those, uh, to, to borrow it, another Evans's term, those uh, supposed nuggets, because nuggets usually point to mountains where there are much more gold, uh, not less. Right, right. Very, very good. Uh, very good point about nuggets. Then we go, we go look for the the vein of ore there in the yes. And of course, I kind of made a joke about that in the book. I have a section called "Hold the Nuggets," so I'm <laughs> translating it into chicken nuggets um, at that point. But that was, of course, his metaphor was a, a gold metaphor. But um, yeah, an, an eternal life is a is a Pauline phrase and also supposedly a Johannine phrase. Very interesting uh, point there. The, the other possibility is that, which is not incompatible with note taking, John would have been preaching this stuff from early on. And I find that the word homiletic, which of course means referring to preaching, gets used by scholars with the word embellishment or the word elaboration. So they'll say homiletic embellishment, homiletic elaboration in John. What they never take cognizance of is the possibility that instead of elaborating by his homiletics, John could be consolidating 
that so uh, and that elaborating versus consolidating is a phrase I got from my husband Tim and I, I like it that when you speak <clears throat> and you tell about something shortly after it happened it fixes it in your own mind. If I come home from the store and I've had a fun conversation with someone that I happen to run into at the store and I tell my family about it that evening out loud, then that helps to fix into my mind what happened. So I will remember it better. It consolidates it. And so there's kind of a failure to think about that consolidating function of homiletics that John could be starting preaching during those very early days of the church and and the so so let's say the farewell discourse at the last supper would have been very fresh in his mind it would only have been you know two months ago for example very you know recent and he's been thinking about it all along and then he, it's the early church and he starts telling people about it that's going to fix it in his mind so i think there's this faulty view that if you think of the gospel as being written down fairly late in the century which i'm open to i think it was in his old age the patristic sources agree with that um that that means he remained completely silent in between or was elaborating it and it was kind of developing and jesus words were kind of growing like a like a a uh, tale that grows in between, as opposed to he consolidates it with his preaching, and then he's preaching consistently with this, and he's been remembering it all along by uh, by telling it to others. Also, to the reality that Jesus's trial fundamentally focuses on his claims, which seem, at least in Mark's gospel, Mark fourteen, to deeply overlap with that of a Johannine witness. You know, are you the Christ, the son of the blessed? You know, only Mark says, I am. And you will see the son of man seated at the right hand of the power, Daniel 7, coming in the clouds of heaven. And this idea, in my mind, and maybe I'm pushing it too far, that out of anyone's witness that would have been of primary focus in the early church, uh, it would have probably been the guy who's, you know, the caretaker of the mother of the the, the founder of, of the faith principally uh the eyewitness to the crucifixion itself the one who's present at the empty tomb and the one who happens to be the last surviving direct apostolic eyewitness i mean that seems to be grounds to want to focus on his idiom or his voice or his uh historical eyewitness reported memory first and foremost and that's why in ignatius for example when he speaks of the Lord's Supper or the Eucharist, there does seem to be a heavy emphasis on almost internalizing John 6 in the way that you would expect of a student of John, the, the apostle. That's yes, why, sir. you know, yeah, exactly. I was going to say one of the oddest, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with this, uh, scholarly tropes is the idea that John is anti-sacramental. I don't know if you've run into this in your reading. I run into no, it. No, I have not found this. this Very is odd. This. And what they'll do is they'll say that John 6, uh, the Bread of Life discourse, is an attempt to counteract and overemphasis over on the physical sacrament uh, in the early church by translating the physical sacrament into um, believing on Jesus. So it's almost like they're picturing John as some kind of early Baptist or something. <laughs> you know, different, different John the Baptist, not that John the Baptist, but that he's, you know, out there trying to say, no, no, it's not taking the physical sacrament that is, you know, brings you eternal life, but rather it's believing, you know, he that believes on me and so forth. And all I can say is if that was his goal, um, he did a really bad, he did a really bad job, you know, because John 6 sounds very pro-sacramental. It sounds about the opposite of anti-sacramental, which is part of why there's been so much controversy about it theologically um, in trying to say that it, you know, doesn't refer to the sacrament because on the face of it, it looks like it does. So, I mean, my goodness, if I wanted to do an anti-sacramental uh, discourse, I think I would not write it that way. So that's kind of, I didn't know if you'd ever run across that. It's really odd. Right. My flesh is real food to quote the NIV of all translations and my blood is real drink. And if anyone eats my flesh and drinks my blood, I abide in him and him in me. Yeah, I mean, basically it, it seems to me that the patristics in the Lacona, Evans, even at times, regrettably, William Lane Craig theses are utterly forgotten or transposed differently or seen through uh, a rather unusual filter. 
And it seems to me that we need to read the New Testament as N.T. Wright claims in its historical context, but that means in its historical context, not in our historiography of their historical context, if that makes any sense, with soft postmodernism. You know, one, you know, to, to make sure that we can cram everything in with the time that we have, you know, one thing I want to emphasize too is the actual apostolic authorship of the Gospel of John, because one wedge between the patristics and uh, the New Testament that always is made in the circles I've been reading is Papias never knew John, or uh, there was never any connection between uh, John's voice or any others because John must have been martyred at the same time as James, his brother. Never mind that Aramaeus mentions John the disciple repeatedly. So my question is, what are your best proofs for Johannine authorship of the fourth gospel? Well, there's several different, you know, prongs. And you probably saw the way I did it was kind of unusual in the book. <clears throat> so chapter four argues that the author was named John and that he was the same as the beloved disciple. He was an eyewitness of the ministry and that he was not a stay at home. So that, uh, you know, he, he traveled with Jesus to Galilee as well as in Jerusalem. To that extent, I only, in chapter four, argued against Richard Balcom a little bit. And that was on the stay at home part because- I noticed. Thinks, yeah, he thinks that the, um, that the author was named John, that he was the beloved disciple, that he was a disciple of Jesus' ministry. He was an eyewitness of much of what he reports, but not the Galilee sections, except for the chapter 21, but not the earlier Galilee sections, uh, that he got those from someone else. And I, and I even give props to Balcom for going so far as to conjecture where he might have gotten the marriage at Cana. He suggests it might have been come from Nathaniel. I like it when somebody, you know, if you're going to say somebody wasn't an eyewitness that you'll you'll take it seriously enough to say, well, wh what eyewitness did he get it from? But I disagree with him. I think he actually traveled with him. So that's what I do in chapter four. And I've got all those arguments for, um, you know, patristic external sources for those propositions. Then, of course, all the arguments for the reliability are ipso facto arguments for eyewitness testimony and in that sense arguments that it was written by a disciple who would have been there um, and then in the, the appendix I have this long appendix which is sort of like a little monograph in itself and I'd like to think some people would buy buy it for that anyway I um I actually do engage even more directly with Richard Balcom's thesis Balcom's thesis uh is that it was written by a different uh, sort of what you might almost call a 13th disciple named John, who was the beloved disciple, but was not the son of Zebedee. And uh, I, I really, it, it is compatible, that thesis is compatible with a very conservative view, it, it, even more conservative than Balcom's own view. But there are staunch conservatives who take that view. Um, yeah, I won't even I won't even name them, but people, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, no, but but you know people who really take so okay. Uh, one, I don't think he'll mind me naming him. Shane Rosenthal of of the White Horse Inn is very strong in the historicity of John. He is no um, compromiser on that, but he's poured a good bit of time into trying to convince me of the Balcom thesis, and um, so we've kind of had a friendly on going back and forth. And in some ways, you could almost say that I had Shane in mind uh, when I wrote some of these sections and when I separated it out that way, or people like Shane who were not taking a liberal thesis, but I'd like to um, not, in a sense, antagonize them. So that's why I put some of it off into the appendix. But uh, I, I do think it adds extra uncertainty and unnecessary uncertainty. And one of the concerns I have is that I believe that the patristic authors are saying that it was John, the son of Zebedee. Here, here. Malcolm has to reinterpret Irenaeus, for example. So when he says John, the disciple of the Lord, or he says he was an apostle, he has to interpret that as an ambiguous term. Now let's suppose that we imagine someone coming along who ag agrees partly with me and partly with Malcolm. So like agrees with me that the patristic authors are saying that it was the son of Zebedee, but agrees with Balcom that it wasn't the son of Zebedee. What's that person going to do? There's a real danger there. That person's just going to throw the patristic authors out altogether, 
right? That person is going to say, well, then maybe it wasn't an eyewitness at all. And that person is going to be more inclined to throw a, a much greater doubt on the eyewitness nature of the gospel than Balcom does. So we always have to look at how people can sort of mix and match their their arguments to come to a, a different conclusion. So I, since I think it's so obvious that those authors are are saying it's the gospel of, or it's the uh, son of Zebedee, I think I need to be defending that too if I'm not going to encourage people to throw out the patristic, you know, baby with the uh, Zebedee and bathwater, as it were, which I don't think is bathwater. You know, I mean, I think it really was the son of Zebedee. So one one argument that I have, I don't want to give all of my trade secrets away here because I want people to get the book, but one argument that I have that uh, has been highlighted on a blog called Try a Blog, Jason Engler like this one, was the the uh, fisherman nature of the author. So the, the non-Zebedean theory has the author being a resident of Jerusalem. He's not going to be a fisherman in that case. He's because he's not from the Sea of Galilee area. He you might call him what we would call a landlubber. He's a guy who, you know, he doesn't go out there on the on the Sea of Galilee. And maybe he's even of a slightly higher class. Um, maybe he's uh, from the Sadducean branch and he's really, really close to the high priest. That's something they use, that statement that he was known to the high priest, they'll argue means they were like tight. And it doesn't have to mean that they were tight. It doesn't have to mean they were yeah. his buddies. Okay. So he was like from that, those circles. Uh, and he doesn't travel very much. Well, in John 21, we find that he has traveled to Galilee, which I think everyone acknowledges if it's that the beloved disciple is there. And uh, Peter says, I'm going fishing at the beginning of John 21. And these other guys, six, six other men say, we'll come with you. And it becomes very clear when they see Jesus the next morning that the son of Zebedee, uh, well, no, at the beginning, it mentions the sons of Zebedee were there. And then it becomes clear that the beloved disciple was there because the disciple Jesus loved is on the boat with Peter and he says it is the Lord. So he's one of the seven who are there. Now we have to remember they did not know they were going to see Jesus the next morning. They did not say, hey, let's go fishing. And maybe if we fish all night, Jesus will show up tomorrow morning. They're just going on a fishing expedition. If you are a landlubber from uh, the Jerusalem region. You only came there because Jesus had left orders. Uh, go meet me. I'm going to meet you again in Galilee. So you you went up there for that reason. You were hoping to meet Jesus. And one e fine evening, Peter says, "Hey guys, want to stay out all night on my boat fishing?" Are you going to say, sure, I, I, I think that's great. You know, what is what was he hoping for a new experience in his life or something? You know, nothing I'd like better than staying up all night fishing. Absolutely. I mean, I think that's very implausible. I'm not saying it's not possible, but I think it's very implausible. So we have this person who appears to be comfortable on the sea. He also knows multiple names for the Sea of Galilee because he knows that it's also called the Sea of Tiberias twice. Yeah. Yep. He knows how approximately how far they had rode when they saw Jesus walking to them across the water. Um, you know, you're going to have to say maybe he got that from a source who was uh, present. I suppose Balcom doesn't even think he was present on that occasion. But I think we can unify all of this better by supposing an author who was himself a fisherman. So that's one set of arguments I have for Zebedean authorship. Here's also to an incredibly crazy theory. Uh, every able-bodied able male Jew had to go to Jerusalem up like at least three times a year. So even if he's born uh, technically in the north, he has to be in Jerusalem repeatedly throughout his basically early adult life. I mean, it's, it's implausible to say that, oh, he was absolutely never familiar with Jerusalem whatsoever at all. Like, why, why would he ever go to Jerusalem? Uh, in the same way, I think it's equally implausible to say that the synoptics portrait of a single trip to Jerusalem uh, is uh, essentially the only one. I mean, we would expect Christ to, as, as a Jewish male, to go to Jerusalem several different times. Um, and simply because he emphasizes Jerusalem doesn't mean he's a resident of Jerusalem. Um, he is obviously filling in the gaps for the synoptics, as I think you, you illustrate very beautifully. So for me, it, it seems a matter of emphasis and just because someone emphasizes a point doesn't mean that's their entire expertise out of curiosity just again just just for the viewers um how 
how are we to make sense of he was known to the high priest? Because I think on the White Horse podcast, I, I think you you made a very good argument. It's, it's I think it was along the lines of, well, known doesn't necessarily, as you say, mean buddies. And secondarily, if John is the member of a prosperous fishing business, um, it's very likely he is taking his business to Jerusalem. Are we assuming that the high priest family is not eating fish? You know, is, is there some... A bias against getting produce? Is there, is there any reason why that would not take place? And the other curiosity as well, now John doesn't seem to be uh, disinterested in theological matters, quite the contrary. He seems to have been, uh, if not a direct acolyte, at least an associate of John the Baptist. Uh, there does seem to be a deep interest, interest in uh, his own heritage, his own background. Uh, it's possible, for example, some have even tried to push an Essene connection. I think that's maybe taking it a step too far. I don't know if we have a direct link there. So I'm just curious how we can um, array that, that sentence because I do think there are good plausible, plausible counter arguments for, oh, there's no way it could have been the fisherman from Galilee because how could he ever have known the high priest? been known to the high priest. So I think we want to deal with a concept called semantic range. Uh, every word has a semantic range. It can, you know, so, you know, the word yellow has a certain semantic range of color that it can cover and so forth. And in the same way, this word uh, nostos or gnostos, we would transliterate a G-N-O-S-T-O-S, -O -O known to the high priest, um, has a semantic range. Uh, I, I do a pretty detailed study of this in the book where I note how some older authors, especially C.K. Barrett, who was a very, uh, quite a liberal scholar, but um, notes that the semantic range can include a close friend and then jumps to the conclusion that the word means a close friend so that you know he can find so for example in the septuagint my own familiar friend in whom i trusted has lifted up his heel against me in the, that's the septuagint in the septuagint of that psalm uses a cognate of that word gnosis so it's a close friend okay so it can mean a close friend. That doesn't mean it always means a close friend. Or for example, in uh, in Luke, where it talks about the Jesus' parents taking a journey to Jerusalem, and it says they were they thought that Jesus was with their friends, nostos, or their ki and their kinsmen, their friends and kinsmen. And so then people will say, well, friend means kinsmen. Well, you you know you can have redundancy. You can have somebody use. Uh, words that actually essentially are synonyms twice, but it doesn't have to. A kinsman could mean something different from uh, friends, you know, so, or friend could include kinsman. So again, there's this idea that gnostos has to be really close. It's, we don't have a contemporary English word that has exactly that semantic range. Sometimes the word is translated acquaintances. Near the cross, Luke says his, his acquaintances and it's um, male, it's a masculine, his male acquaintances, and he uses gnostos, were standing afar off near the cross. How close to Jesus were they? We don't know. Does it mean relatives? We don't know. So we don't have an exact equivalent for that. Um, you know, acquaintances is good, but in American English, we tend to take that to mean you're not a close friend. You're an acquaintance as opposed to a close friend. So if you can imagine a word acquaintance, you know, acquaintance hyphen, but could be a close friend, this word doesn't tell you one way or another, you know, that's gnostos, you know. So uh, we don't, we don't know exactly where the beloved disciple fell on that range. It could be that he was just a mere acquaintance. What we need to focus on is the fact that in um, in that passage, it doesn't actually say that the high priest met him at the door and let him in. It's the girl at the door who lets him in. He just has to be known enough to the high priest and the household that the girl at the door recognizes him. So this could be a distant kinsman, like a second cousin or something. This could be a fish salesman. Interestingly, when uh, Whitehorse Inn interviewed Richard Balcom, he was just scornful of this, uh, you know, yes. of, of the, the, the fish sales. And he said, because the fish industry was dominated, it was like there was a monopoly. And I believe he said from Magdala, the town of Magdala. 
And so there's no way that fishermen from Capernaum would have been known in selling the fish down in Jerusalem because, you know, it was the mag, I think he said Magdala that dominated the trade. Well, and I'm like, well, hold on. You know, it's not like Magdala is all that far from Capernaum anyway. You know, how do we know? What do, I mean, let's not get to a priori here. What do we know about the connection of the Zebedee family with the Magdala fish trade? For all we know, they could have been involved in that, in that fish trade. So that's weird. I'm, but at the same time, I think sometimes when I have this friendly argument with Shane, he tries to make me pin, you know, pin my hat or hang my hat on this fisherman hypothesis, like that's the only possible route. And I'll say to him, this is just a proof of concept. This is just what scientists call a proof of concept, that it's, here's a possible route that's not wildly implausible. Another possible route that's not wildly implausible could be a distant kinsman. I mean, after all, Jesus appears to have been a distant kinsman of the priestly class through his mother's being the cousin of Elizabeth, or at least he could have been, okay, through his, or or by marriage, kinship by marriage, because Elizabeth is um, married to Zechariah, the high priest. I mean, it, we learn, here's something we need to realize, we learn about the fluidity of social boundaries by reading source material. We don't come along 2000 years after the fact and say, we know how rigid the social boundaries would have been between a fisherman from Galilee and the household of the high priest in first century AD Palestine. And now we're going to decide who could and couldn't have been gnostos to the high priest at the time. No way. No way. The fluidity of social boundaries is exactly the kind of thing you need to learn by reading original source material. And the Gospel of John is original source material. So let's maybe uh, be willing to learn from that. Oh, I guess maybe a fisherman could be known to the high priest. You know, the evidence can go both ways there. And, and we need to be willing to um, gain new information in that way about exactly that kind of thing that we really don't know all that much about a priori. Also, to throw more interest on the fire there, let's assume just a priori for a moment that there is some kind of kinship uh, by blood between even if it's distant between john the beloved disciple and apostle and that of the high priest then committing uh his mother into the care of uh the beloved apostle would make a lot more sense as well in terms of protection i mean are you really going to chase uh your your kinsman down essentially who's acting as caretaker uh, I don't know. They might have. They were they were pretty mad, <laughs> you know. Um, it's it. That's an interesting one. And actually, those who hold the Balcom thesis will sometimes say exactly that in the other direction. They'll say, right, it was somebody who was really really close to the high priest, therefore not the son of Zebedee, and that's why Jesus committed him to her for protection. So they'll take it that direction. So it's it's an interesting kind of internecine argument. I've tried really hard not to place too much emphasis upon it. Um, yeah. Because yeah. on the other hand, I mean, it can go both ways. There can be people who say it was authored by a different John who take a very robust historical perspective. And there are people who can say it was authored by the son of Zebedee who take a very weak historical perspective. So it can go both directions. Ultimately, the more important question is how historical is this document? How historical is, is this gospel? And that's ultimately what I want to be focusing all of my arguments on. It, it just seems to me that if I assume apostolic authorship of the Gospel of John, and then I assume the portrait of Irenaeus, and I, I think that the assumption is pretty solid. It, it's a much stronger historical assumption, for example, than assuming that you know Plato is Plato, in, in my mind in regards to dating. The thing is, then you have a direct link from the foot of the cross in the empty tomb, and you know, vis-a-vis -vis Mary also to the nativity, all the ways up until the 90s, and then through not just you know, direct students like Ignatius, but technically speaking, if we assume the thesis that John's students are wide-traveled and well-known, could Justin Martyr, who definitely visited Ephesus, uh, could he have read material there? Could he have met with people who had read archives from John's homiletics? You know, it, it seems that there could be this massive joking in the shadow all throughout the second century. And there does seem to be, you know, between the quadradeciman argument, in terms of the dating of Easter, uh, you know, there does seem to be this massive joking footprint, as it were, that kind of dissects 
the rest of essentially the following century. So in that way, the living eyewitness memory carries on. It doesn't die sometime mysteriously in the mid fifties. But that's my own basically ax to grind, uh, mostly dealing with me trying to preserve uh, a sense of, of linkage uh, historical memory and linkage. And you can technically do that with the other John theory, because again, he is a disciple on that theory. You know, it's just like a different one named John. And then he ends up being the Ephesian elder. He ends up being John the elder. He ends up being the guy who preserves the memory of Jesus, that living and abiding voice that Papias refers to and so forth, as opposed to the, the son of Zebedee. Uh, in fact, Baucom would even, I think, like to extend the word apostle. Of course, we do find um, occasionally, I think Barnabas is even referred to as an apostle. There are looser and tighter uses of the term apostle. And that's something I spend a lot of time discussing in that appendix, because my problem with trying to apply a, a looser term apostle to the author is that when someone calls him an apostle, like one of the um, church fathers, they clearly think that they are disambiguating. They clearly think that by calling him an apostle, they're drawing attention to a unique person. Whereas if you if they're using the term loosely, then what are they doing? Then they're actually two John the Apostles. And, and then they're trying to use a disambiguator that doesn't work. So that doesn't make sense. So to me, it makes it's a much more economical idea that there was only one John the Apostle. And therefore, that's why they could use that term to help to clarify matters for their own readers. Yeah, and, and for example, I mean, for the first 300 years, it's basically consistent, but that's the primary thesis. And it's only with Eusebius that two Johns are introduced and not even consistently because in the, what, the Chronicle at first, he basically assumes a Johannine authorship for both the fourth gospel and the apocalypse. Then later on in the Ecclesiastical, oh, let me fix that quickly. Ah, there we go. Yeah, John, just like backtrack a sentence or two. In other words, uh, and then with the uh, ecclesiastical history, uh, he changes his mind yet again. And basically now suddenly, now that he has a political axe to grind against the apocalypse as an authentically Johannine work, he suddenly shifts gears and basically presents the theory and has to defend it as well. He, he doesn't uh, reference it uh, with sleight of hand or offhand. He actually ends up doing so uh, you know, as though he's building and, and constructing a case. So it, it does seem to me that if you have 300 years of consistent history, I, I like those odds. I, I definitely will stand on those odds, but you are right, regardless, the, the key fact is we're dealing with a credible eyewitness rather than someone who is writing uh, Jesus fan fiction, uh, facing certain death. I think it's also really important to know that even Eusebius and Dionysius of, I think it was Dionysius of Alexandria, who suggested that another John wrote the Apocalypse, neither of them believed that that other John wrote the Gospel. In fact, they were both very explicit that it was the son of Zebedee who wrote the Gospel. In fact, we don't find a single church father suggesting that anyone else uh, wrote the gospel in in any in any clear way. That's why it's necessary to reinterpret all of these church fathers. So uh, we never find, and there's a lot of confusion out there about that. That if there's any passage or any reference to anything that could be another John, that this e is equivalent to saying that this other John wrote the gospel. Those are not equivalent, and uh, that can lead to quite a. Um, quite a blunder. I've known more than one person make that blunder because, of course, there's that famous passage of Papias where Papias might be referring to two people named John. I mean, there's controversy about that. You could read him to be referring to two people named John. And then people will think that means Papias said that the other John wrote the gospel. And no, you know, Papias just talks about people he could talk to or people he knew and uses the word John in two different sentences in a way that might refer to two different people, but he doesn't attribute the gospel to, to the, the latter of them at all. In fact, we don't have any acknowledged writing by Papias in which he directly addresses the authorship of the gospel. So we need to be careful about that, that none of these guys are attributing the gospel to this other John, even if, even if such a person existed. So anyway, yeah, that's, that's all really cool. Um, I wanted to go back a little bit to what you were talking about concerning the patristics and um, 
Papias and the, the concern for truth and everything, you will find some very odd things that people in the, the Evans camp will do with passages from Papias. It's like, it's like everybody wants a piece of Papias. You know, everybody wants to claim Papias you know, for, for their side in a, given, uh, in a given controversy. So he has this very famous passage about the authorship of Mark and how Mark um, was writing down the memories of Peter. I'm, you probably have that passage memorized. You probably have it memorized in the Greek, John. Anyway, um, so it's a very, very famous passage that everybody's, that we've got like four different translations of it out there and so forth. And in it, he talks about, um, he talks about Peter telling his anecdotes, telling the stories of Jesus. And he says, you can translate it as according to Krei, or you can translate it as, as there was need. <clears throat> you can translate it as, in the form of anecdotes. There's like three different ways you can translate it. And it actually uses the word krea, and that's like the actual Greek word. So Dr. Evans has this elaborate argument where he just grabs that one word and he literally picks it radically out of context, associates it with the uh, exercises, the uh, rhetorical exercises of the time, further associate <laughs> those exercises of the time with um, the alteration of fact, then attributes an endorsement of the alteration of fact to Papias because Papias uses that Greek word concerning Peter, okay? This is a chain of really poor inference. I mean, it's wrong, like at every inference, at every stage. For example, even Richard Balcom says that crei there just means anecdotes. It doesn't refer to like rhetorical, the rhetorical schools. Second, the rhetorical exercises aren't teaching them to alter facts anyway. See the mirror or the mask, I discussed that. And thirdly, Papias in the context says that Mark did, took care not to falsify anything. So in the greater context, Papias is emphasizing the literal truthfulness of the gospel of Mark. So Evans is doing something illicit in so many different ways to grab that word crei out of context. Then another thing they'll do is that in that same famous passage, um, it says that he didn't do it according to order or in an orderly fashion. That uses the Greek word taxis for order. Uh, and there's a kind of debate, did he mean uh, rhetorical order or did he mean um, chronological order? Well, suppose we take taxis to mean chronological order, that Mark did not narrate according to order. Well, then you'll find uh, people, you know, I was just reading Craig Keener does this the other day that uh, see, he, he and, and he excuses that. So Papias seems to be okay with that. He says he did nothing wrong because he was just writing down what Peter was saying and he had not followed Jesus himself. So see, it's okay with Papias that Mark doesn't narrate according to order. So oh. that must mean it's okay with Papias that John or that Mark is changing the order, wait a minute. That's, that's... So that means it was okay for the ancients, for people to change the order of events and narrate in what I've elsewhere called this chronological narration. So again, this is another place where you're taking one word of Papias, you're taking it out of context, you're ignoring the fact that he says Mark took care not to falsify anything, and you're using it to argue that it was okay with Papias for the gospel authors to change the day or the time when when people did that, and then it's supposed to be okay for John to change when Jesus cleansed the temple, and we're kind of like off to the races. We have this long chain of really poor inferences. So that's kind of what they do with the church fathers, and it's it's not seeing the forest for the trees. It's like you got your nose up against this one leaf on one tree, which is this word order or this word crei, and then we're elaborating this huge theory out of it and using it to contradict the, the very context of what Papias says. And I would submit that that's not a good way to do patristic scholarship. From the Eye of the Beholder, which I, I believe has done positive grace for the church in regards to just lifting up the minds of fellow members of the lady and, and pastors and even the scholarly community to realize the problems in analyzing Jeronian literature. Where do you plan on going from here? Because I, I believe that you have the fullness of the New Testament before you, you have brilliant philosophical points in terms of, of uh, apologetics, contemporary work. Where do you think the trail will blaze? 
Well, I want to keep up my YouTube channel. That's something I'm doing a lot with, and I really encourage any of your viewers, if you haven't yet, please subscribe, because uh, sometimes I'm going over things I've already written on, but some of it's new, totally new material. It's fresh material, and it's material nobody else is doing. For example, uh, I just did one on our concept of the resurrection body, interacting some with Dale Allison's new book, which I haven't done anywhere else. Um, in my next one, I'm planning to talk a little bit about um, the raising of the saints passage in Matthew and how that fits together with what I call epistemic routing and what's a premise for what and so forth. And as an epistemologist, I'm uniquely qualified to do that. So I really wanna keep that up and that's pretty time consuming. Uh, another thing is that in the fall, I've been invited to uh, be on I guess it's not exactly a panel, but it's a Johannine session at the uh, in the Johannine section of the Evangelical Theological Society meeting in Fort Worth, Texas. So I'll be presenting there on John's historical reliabilities. That was an invitation, and I was really honored that the the committee invited me to come and present. I'll be the um, I'll be an outsider. Each session is allowed one person who is not a member of the ETS to present. So I assume I'm I'm that one person uh, to present there. So that's one place I'm going. Uh, I'm also sending out works to be uh, evaluated for publication for blind peer review in certain um, certain New Testament studies journals. Obviously, I'm not going to say where, but uh, so I'm working on that next. That's another thing. I have one scholarly publication in Thamelios on uh, multiple attestation and independence. Uh. It's already out there. So I'm trying to get more of those. Uh, and then something I'm thinking of doing, and it's just, it's not, it's percolating right now, but is a popular level book, more popular than, uh, and, and, and I really want people who are, would consider themselves laymen to please do get the mirror or the mask of the eye of the beholder. Yes, it is written for you, but they are kind of long and that can be kind of daunting. So what I'm thinking of possibly doing is some kind of a popular level thing where I'm bringing in stuff from all three of the books and boiling it down, making it shorter, maybe some, sort of a best of type of thing. And then maybe uh, working on some curriculum to go with it for like a Bible study, for like a lay Bible study, maybe an adult or college level um, Sunday school or private Bible study that people can have study questions and a leader can uh, lead discussion and that kind of thing. And this would do way less citation. You know, I would do more of the thing, you know, maybe it'll be even considered more ironic in a sense, because I would do more of the, you know, some scholars have said, but but here's the real truth with, uh, I wouldn't have to have as many footnotes because it's a, it's a more of a popular level work. Um, and, you know, people who want to look and find out who those scholars are can read my other books and find out that, guess what? It's also evangelical scholars. Um, people have wanted me to do that kind of thing, but you can't do that in scholarly work. If you're writing something where you're actually saying, many scholars have said this, and you need to be warned because someone might come into your church and actually say that, what are you going to, what are you going to do? Uh, footnote guess who, you know, your, your yeah. footnotes, you have to actually cite and quote and cite page numbers and so forth. It should go without saying. But in a, a more of a summary work of this kind, where the scholarly work's already out there and has already been done, I could do it more in that way. So that's a possibility. I need to talk more with other people and with my publisher about that as some direction I might go to really build up the church with a confidence in the historical reliability of the gospel. So those are some ideas. And I wanna keep up my philosophical publishing at the same time. There's been an interesting dovetailing where I'll have these totally secular philosophical publications. One just just came out in online first for the journal Synthes on contradictions in witness testimony. You can obviously see where that would be relevant to the Gospels, but it doesn't it doesn't talk about the Gospels, you know, explicitly. Um, I'm just trying to do it for any document. So I want to keep doing things of that kind at the same time. Well, I think it's very promising. And what it honestly reveals is the fact that we do have solid ground to stand on. Uh, we're not simply, you know, as members of the body of Christ, looking merely at a uh, two millennia old movie that's been handed on to us, our Jane Austen novel, uh, loosely based off of uh, some event that may, may or may not have occurred. And for the skeptic investigating, it should be incredibly encouraging because who wouldn't want to have a more intimate portrait with the most pivotal events 
that ever occurred in human history that's been seismic so i'm i am really excited to see what comes our way and uh yeah we, we look forward to keeping posted and i also encourage our viewers to absolutely subscribe to the channel and we will include the link to the channel in the notes as well cool and a link to the eye of the beholder of course you're here absolutely you're here. all right thank you for having me john it's been fun absolutely lydia all of our gratitude <laughs> <laughs>